Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you all for coming to attend this, our third online Evil and Wrench program. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment, as is the custom, to go over the procedure for asking questions during the presentation. To do this, you can simply enter your questions in the chat or Q&A modules whose buttons are located at the bottom center of your Zoom screen. You can do this at any time during the presentation, but questions will only be answered during the appointed Q&A section at the end of the presentation. Also, I would like to congratulate the Albany, Atlanta, and Central Florida branches for registering the most attendees for today's program. Now, I would like to introduce ESU Executive Director, Karen Karpovich, to introduce Hillary Davidson. Karen? Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is an exciting evening. We first learned of Hillary in the spring, right before the pandemic. And we were hoping that she could be part of our, our wrench series in person. But unfortunately, COVID got in the way. And we've been trying to connect with Hillary now for a while. And she's a busy woman and she travels a great deal, but I know she's well worth waiting for. Uh, the notion of being able to enjoy the discussion on the clothing of the Regency period and any evening on Jane Austen is always an incredible treat for everyone. Um, I don't know if any of you have recently seen the Emma, which is currently on HBO, which if you're talking about clothing is one of the most incredible pieces of work in terms of design and Regency adapted clothing. I do recommend it if you're a, a Regency fan and if you're interested in clothing of the period, which I'm sure you all are. It's absolutely beautiful. I do recommend that. But let's start. And as I said, Hillary is an amazing speaker and we're so happy to have her. And without further ado, I'd like Hillary to start. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you so much, Karen, for that very warm welcome. And thank you everyone for coming this evening. I really appreciate um, you being here. And um, I think it's amazing that we can all come together in this way. I'm currently in London uh, where I am stuck. I can't get back to Australia. And I came here after I was actually in the United States, but when everything uh, started going pear-shaped, as they say here, I came to Britain and I still haven't managed to get home. So I'm really glad you could all be here and thank you so much for coming. So I think I will just share my screen and we will begin. So I'll just move it so I can see. So Dress in the Age of Jane Austen. This is this talk uh, and this the book that came from it well, that, that, that feeds into it, uh, the result of about six years of research that uh, emerged. Well, I'd started being, been started working around the Regency period when I was living in Winchester in Hampshire, which is kind of one of the, the heartlands of, of Austen's um, area. And so this is the book that I came up with, Dress in the Age of Jane Austen. And what I wanted to do was to have a look at Regency dress through the lens of Jane Austen's life and writings, but to really start re kind of start fresh and to reinterrogate what I knew and what I thought I knew about Regency dress and then share those findings with other people as well. So uh, as I say, it was a long time in the making. It came out last year with Yale University Press and um, has had a very pleasing reception. So I want to talk tonight about some of the things that I found while researching the book and some of the pleasing ways and unexpected ways that I started to look at Regency dress fresh, um, having done this research. And as Karen mentioned, um, one of the, the potent things about Jane Austen is how much we engage with the visual world of her works through screen and through adaptations, all of which have costumes attached to them on the bodies of modern actors and actresses. And as one uh, scholar has said, in popular culture, Regency England becomes a timeless mythological place called Austenshire, which is dominated by this kind of flickering light of cinema and all of these bodies dressed in our ideas of Regency clothing. 
But when you actually read the books of, of Jane Austen, as I'm sure many people here have done many times, she doesn't actually talk about clothing directly all that much. So I wanted to see what was actually going on, what is happening in this age of Austen, um, and how that might sort of intersect with or challenge some of the ideas about what the, the Regency dressed past looked like that have been so shaped by, uh, you know, 25 odd years of, of excellent adaptations. I know there were some before there, but really those 1990s adaptations um, took off again. And I'd, I'd like to concur with Karen that the current Emma, the 2021, I think is the best costumed screen adaptation of an Austin work ever made. So I'm sure many of you will be very familiar with Jane Austen's uh, dates and life, but for those of you who are less so, this is sort of the, 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 the precy of her life. She's born in 1775, so um, at the same time as American independence, and she is the six, seventh of eight children. She's got six brothers and one very beloved sister, Cassandra. She moves to Bath with her um, parents and her sister in 1801. Her father dies in 1805 and then the family moves to Southampton. And in 1809, she finally moves to the village of Chawton in Hampshire and has a settled home there for the rest of her life, which is cut uh, un very untimely short at the age of 41. She dies in 1817 of um, a long illness. But during that period where she's living in Chawton, she revises, completes and publishes six novels, although the last two, Persuasion and Northanger Abbey, were published posthumously. So what Austen does is gives us introduction to a quite genteel and bourgeois world. Um, uh, it, it's very much a middle class gentility and very much focused on the south of England, uh, which is the areas that she knew and moved in. And so but her, her work also tallies nicely with the, the actual Regency period, which although it's technically 1812 to 1820, which is when the Prince of Wales takes over from um, George III as ruler of Britain, I, in the book, look at what I call a long Regency from about 1795 to about 1825, this incredible transformative period over the turn of that century. So, but to use Austen as a starting point into Regency dress, she is foremost a social commentator. And because dress is a nuanced social marker, um, in, in her work, clothing and needlework really pinpoints niceties of character. And at the same time, uh, what survives of her letters, uh, about 161 of an estimated 3,000 that she wrote in her lifetime, they reveal um, more than the novels. They reveal a very lively sartorial interest and a lot of concerns about how to dress well on a limited income. So I think one of the things that really appeals to people about the Regency period is, in a sense, it's the first time that we can really see ourselves in the past. People start to, it's like the modern body emerges. Once you strip off all of that size and, and you know distortion of the 18th century, people start to look more like us. And I feel this is one of the, the, the reasons um, that we respond to it quite so well. And it's, it's so popular amongst um, uh, costumers and, and researchers of all, all kinds. And what I really realized is that because Austen is a of the middle gentry class, um, if you look at her, not just as this kind of monumental and singular author, if you place her as an exceptionally observant woman who is now part of the best biographized non-elite, as in non-aristocratic family in the Georgian period, the Austens are an amazing family to look at to study Regency dress because what kept emerging is just how typical they are as middle class consumers and the way that her whole extended family acquires and wears and maintains dress falls within the general patterns of their status and income and her fictional spheres are modeled closely on the observations from this pattern of life and I, I love this picture of um, being at a fair with the kind of the, the the sense of life and normality and people buying things and the shoes being shined and there's a real kind of gorgeous, gorgeous evocation of the life of the past there. So I'm going to go through some of the elements of Regency dress that Austen would have known that she would have worn, would have observed around her and that she is also by uh, implication putting into her characters. And one of the greatest fundamental changes in Regency dress is how women supported their bust and shaped their silhouettes. So where um, stays supported women from underneath their clothing. Men's clothing is sort of shapes them from the outside. And as the great 
sort of definer of Regency style is the, the waistline moving underneath the bust. So you have this shift in what were quite triangular inverted cone shaped very heavily bone stays in the 18th century period, they start to become shorter and lighter. And this is when they turn into corsets. So originally um, corsets is, uh, comes from the French corset, meaning a little body, and it just means a lightly boned, softer, um, more body shaped undergarment. And one of the big inventions at this point is two breasts. Um, we haven't seen two breasts on women since the end of the 15th century. It's been a kind of a mono bosom. So we get this kind of a resurgence of the natural body in this period. Uh, and a lot of discussion in fashion papers about women's breasts as well. So this, um, Pictures like this where, frankly, you can see nipples, uh, caused a lot of comments about women's nakedness and nudity. And there's this idea, this very prevailing idea that women no longer wore corsets or stays. And this is, I, I really wanted to kind of investigate a lot of the great Regency myths while I was working on this book. Um, so, and the idea that women completely stopped wearing corsets is patently untrue. Um, I found out that one of one of Austin's best comments in her letters actually has to do with stays where she says in September 1813 that I learned to my high amusement that stays are not now made to force the bosom up, bosom up at all. That was a very unbecoming unnatural fashion. But there are these tiny details in Regency portraits that can show us that even when a woman appears to be going kind of au natural under her clothing, she's still wearing a corset. And one of these details is this little brooch here because this brooch, you can tell by the tension lines on the gown, is actually pinned to something underneath. And that means that she has a busk or some sort of support underneath there, because otherwise she wouldn't be able to pin it too. So what is actually going on is a kind of an illusion of nakedness. And the more I researched into the Regency period, the more I realised that a lot of what is um, happening is illusions of naturalness. While there is this kind of sense of the return to the natural body, Regency dresses spent a long time and a lot of effort faking looking natural. So I really, in the book, I kind of dug for the unusual and the unexpected and the more intimate. How did people get up in the morning and, and dress their bodies? And if you have seen the new Emma, um, I love that scene where she warms her bottom by the fire and it is completely taken from a Regency print. So this is another fantastic picture of, in 1812 um, of a woman taking a shower, but also being uh, her friend being surprised in her underwear. And she still has this kind of transitional stays on um, even as late as 1812. So once I sort of started looking, a lot of the um, received wisdom about Regency dress, it became more quirky and more personally um, attuned. I also became fascinated by the popularity of fake hair. So while in the 18th century, especially for men, the idea of the kind of the white curled wigs and for women, the powdered hair, it defines the 18th century. And it's seen, it's often perceived that as we get into the 1790s and into the Regency period, that kind of disappears, that kind of obvious fakery goes away. But the more I read, the more I realized just how often all that happens is that the wigs change color from being pale and gray to looking natural. And when I, the more I looked at pictures like this, um, this is Thomas Coots, the banker who founded the bank that still uh, is the Queen's Bank in, in Britain. He's in his 70s at this point, but he's got a luscious head of chestnut hair. But if you look at his eyebrows, they are grey and I, he, he's still wearing a wig, but now it looks natural. And it's the same with the, you know, the idea of a fashionable lady in dress and undress. She's wearing a wig made to look like natural hair. And the more I investigated, the more I realised how often uh, strings of curls and false fringes and extra hair was being added to give this kind of Grecian or classical look that is so epitomises the styles of the time. So I loved that kind of looking, I suppose, looking, looking behind the closed doors of the Regency period and seeing how they're working towards achieving fashion on the same human bodies that we all have to deal with. Um, 
I was also very interested in some of the practices that don't get talked about so much, including sewing and needlework, because this really filled women's lives in the age of Jane Austen. Women sewed clothing and trifles for themselves, for their friends and relations, or if they were running a household, they had to supervise employees' work. So the role of sewing, whether that's embroidery or making, um, making clothing, was crucial and once you start reading Austen with an eye to work as it's called any mention of work uh, that her heroines are doing in the novels is sewing and you start to realize how much it was part of the social life of Regency women you can see these girls here in the drawing room with their piano and the work basket underneath with sewing in their hand they took them in cat they took their work baskets into carriages and on visits and in dressing rooms and drawing rooms and it was kind of an accompaniment to the an extension of women's space and an accompaniment to all that socializing that people are doing. But I also really um, wanted to think about what sewing did because again often now there is a trope, um, especially in sort of young adult films and, and books about the heroine who kind of tosses aside her needlework and says you know no I don't want to do this I want to do you know important things but I sew and one of my ways into the Regency period was making, sewing a replica of the only known body garment that once belonged to Jane Austen, uh, a kind of pelisse. So I really appreciate the skills of sewing and how much it was a part of women's lives, but was also a marker of incredible skill and technical ability. Um, I love this, this, this image here. This is a, a picture of a shirt that's in the Victorian Albert Museum in London and it belonged to that same banker Thomas Coots and this here from this measure to this measure is an inch and every there are 50 stitches per inch that's the kind of the level of technical skill that these Regency women could do and I think that's an incredible achievement but because it's kind of white on white and for plain sewing um it gets it gets kind of a bit lost and Jane Austen herself was an excellent stitcher uh, her nephew who was writing after the spread of sewing machines remembered that his aunt's needlework was excellent and he claimed that it might almost have put a sewing machine to shame which you can absolutely see from this um, kind of, of sewing and when women sewed together it was a form of sociability they they could spend time with friends they were doing something productive while also keeping their networks of acquaintances up, which was so important for the kind of the running of Regency society. And I've long maintained that sewing was not a way of kind of, it didn't stifle women's creativity, it was in fact an adjunct to it. Um, and solitary sewing, it really gives time for reflection and consolation, a kind of private mental space to mull things over. So this is three examples of the handwork of Jane Austen. We have um, one of her manuscripts in the center with her very fine, very elegant hand. This is a needle case that she painted for one of her relatives, again, a very fine, delicate hand. And this is the absolutely stunning quality of satin stitch that she embroidered on a um, handkerchief for her sister Cassandra. And she was considered especially great in the satin stitch and it was when I was doing some long Regency sewing and I was mulling over um, words for the book in my head, I realised that it's actually a great sort of meditative space to, to write in. And these hours that Jane Austen spent on her needlework appear to have kind of contributed to her creativity. Her niece Marianne Knight recalls that Aunt Jane would sit quietly working beside the fire in the library saying nothing for a good while and then would suddenly burst out laughing, jump up and run across the room to a table where pens and paper were lying, write something down and then come back to the fire and go on quietly working as before. So I love this sense of her using sewing and um, decorative needlework as a way to sort of form the books and it's completely at odds with this idea of you know needlework is oppression needlework is something that you know is a drudgery um so that was one of the most sort of interesting things for me to sort of reconsider how it needlework was an essential part of Jane Austen's life but um could also contribute to the things that she's best known for 
So I was really interested as well in how women got clothing and how they made clothing. As Austin complained in 1796, I wish such things were to be bought ready made. So I did a lot of investigation into accounts of women's um, purchasing clothing from dressmakers. And we actually, it's still a bit of a mystery. A lot of the processes of how women formed a relationship with their dressmaker and actually decided on the final form of their garment. This picture here is uh, one of the very few we have of a woman out of fitting with the dressmakers um, and how they kind of decide, because everything is made uh, bespoke, how they decide, you know, which fabric to use and which trims to use and how to cut the sleeves and what's fashionable and what works with someone's personal taste and what's within fashion is something that researchers are still very much working on. But bills like this, um, this is the an account from Eliza Jarvis, who is the wife of an MP in Hampshire um, and very organised woman who kept all her bills and accounts. And, and I'm, I'm very grateful to her for doing so. But this is a bill with Mrs. Killick in London. And you can see how the bills are broken down for making a silk dress. And then it's also for trimming it, for lining it, for ribbon that goes onto it. And then two bodies as well, which is itemized separately. And the body is the lining piece for the bodice that is actually where the fitting is done. So it starts to show us how Regency consumers looked at clothing as a kind of um, a multiplicity of elements that are all put together rather than just, you know, one dress. So I looked also um, at other consumption practices. This is one of my favourite things that I found while I was researching, which is the account book of Mrs Mary Topham, who was a, a widow who lived in London. And this is held in the library at Chawton House, uh, where Jane Austen's brother Edward Knight lived. Um, he was adopted by the wealthy branch of the family and it was his inheritance of that house that allowed Austen and her sister and her mother to move into Chawton Cottage. And so this is in the collection here and it's this wonderful list of kind of daily purchases and so many little details of dress about ribbons and um, amongst her knives and her visit from Mrs Chandler and her smelling salts and her black shoes and her patent net shirt um, and this kind of sense of daily buying of things, as in the, the film of Emma when they go into the haberdashery shop and they're tempted by ribbons, as the Bennett girls are in Pride and Prejudice as well. There's a wonderful sense of kind of um, very involved purchasing of clothing in all sorts of smaller parts that then get put together to make a bigger whole. And I love these smaller visions of kind of shopping and retailing as well. This is a shoe shop in Scarborough in about 1812 from a wonderful um, long kind of poem called the, the, the Pleasures of Scarborough, and one of the, the newly fashionable seaside towns of the kind that um, Austen started writing about in Sanditon, her unfinished novel. And you can see uh, the contrast here of the woman in white riding dress, trying a lovely pair of Hessian boots, and the woman in more of the kind of the, the traditional white muslin Regency dress, trying on a pair of um, smaller ready-made shoes there, and the kind of the, the haphazard display of footwear in the window. It's, it's, you know, not particularly polished, but it gives an insight into kind of how people are buying their clothing and how they're thinking about it. And one of the things that the research into um, shopping habits really started to emphasize for me and made me see Regency dress in a different way it was the importance of haberdashery. And all of these elements um, along around the edges here are haberdashery details that are taken from surviving Regency garments in the Museum of London and the Victoria and Albert Museum. And then Madame in Yellow there, I love her because she's wearing so much haberdashery. She's got a ribbon on her cap, she's got a fabulous silk cap, she's got another ribbon underneath here, she's got a lace um, fichu or chemisette. Her gown is um, probably made of either a silk gauze or a, a, a yellow muslin. She's got cording over the front. She's got a trim around the top. She's got cording around the side and then a different fabric on the inside. She's got a belt and then a belt buckle. And all of these smaller accessories are ways of changing taste to keep up with fashion. And the notion of trimming a gown 
you buy it, you, you have a gown made, but then how you trim it and how you refresh those trimmings and all of the accessories that you put onto it were kind of seen as two slightly different things. So you make a gown and then you fashion a gown. And when I looked at how women are buying all of these smaller haberdashery elements and started rereading Austin's letters in terms of um, how often she mentions trimming and changing trimmings, it gave me more of a sense of how individual women were negotiating fashion kind of through their own hand skills and through this kind of wash of waves over the surface, even though they might not change their actual gowns um, underneath so often. So it's just an insight into differences about consumption practices and how people think about clothes, but also importantly, how people see other people's clothes and how they assess them. And one of the ways that women could also participate in kind of faster fashion movement was through their headwear. And caps and uh, bonnets, which are a kind of a new invention in this period, the idea of the, the hat with a brim that goes around the face as opposed to being flat, is something that really picks up speed in the late 1790s and becomes, I would say, one of the defining elements of women's dress in this period. And But underneath this, women are wearing caps indoors at all times, especially once they reach sort of um, old age, which starts at about 40 in the Regency period. Austin and her sister were known for adopting caps earlier. They took to caps at about the age of 25, which was seen as a little bit, um, a little bit, a little bit dowdy. But what we see throughout Austin's letters is how much these smaller items of dress respond to fashion more quickly. They're kind of mobile fashion sites. And we see so many references in her letters to her trimming a hat or she's changing things around or she adds a bit from Cassandra's or she borrows a bit here or, um, you know, she, she's buying new hats and they're cheaper and they're more um, easily changed and bought and adapted than whole gowns. So they're kind of one of the places where people can cite style and respond more quickly to sort of changes in fashion or during the period of the Napoleonic Wars, there's a lot of influence from foreign places and foreign battles. So, you know, to have your new um, Waterloo style cap was much easier and cheaper than having a Waterloo style gown. But of course, one of the great fashion influences um, of the period as well is, is you know, French fashion. And I was very interested in how we can recapture that period eye, that sense of style. If in walking down Pall Mall in London, you could easily spot a French woman by her dress, by her style. How can we see that now? Um, and, you know, I love this picture because it shows us some of the difficulties of kind of getting ourselves into the period eye and seeing the way that Jane Austen and her um, compatriots saw fashion. So this is uh, a, a wonderful plate um, done by the French called L'Empereur Mutuel, the mutual loan. And here we have, English girls dressed in the French fashion. And on this side, we have French girls dressed in the English fashion. Now I can just about, after you know about 10 years working on Regency dress, I can just about pick out the stylistic differences here, but it's very hard from um, the perspective of the modern eye, but it's those kind of nuances of what made style and taste that uh, consumers were very much responding to. So, what Austen makes an interesting distinction about throughout her work is that between what is fashion and what is elegance. And while um, what kind of is, is thought of as elegant changes with each age, my reading is kind of a sense of style, a sense of appropriateness, what we might almost call chic uh, nowadays. And as we know, you know, and I think is a truism for through throughout history, style and fashion are frequently strangers to each other. And Elegant seems to be Austen's highest term of approbation. It's like at the point where what someone is wearing best reflects their character, their figure, their time of life. It's a harmonious um, personal mediation of what is in fashion through the guise of taste. And so we get, um, there's also an accompanying gentility and refinement of manner. So Jane Fairfax in Emma, for example, is described as very elegant, remarkably elegant, while Mrs. Elton has neither feature nor air nor voice nor manner that are elegant. Um, so there's this kind of, as always, the middle classes were struggling to negotiate uh, fashionability with respectability and find a strong middle ground in the middle there. 
So some of the other influences that are coming through in this period is riding dress for both men and women. The new kind of active mobility or the, the increase in active mobility in the um, the late 1790s and a kind of a casualization of clothing. For men, riding dress that was only, used to only be worn for the country started to come into the city. And so lots of elements like the jockey cap, which Austin had one of, uh, the many caped shoulder cape, cape shoulders of uh, great coats and um, groom's coats, uh, the idea of wearing boots in town. It was one of the strongest influences that came through. And after it came through men's dress, it also came through women's dress. So here we have the beginning of the rise also of tailoring. Um, the reputation of Savile Row is made in the early um, 19th century and it maintains today. The idea of clothing that is woolen clothing that is shaped to enhance the body and is about a subtlety of cut rather than an ostentation of decoration was one of the great breaks with 18th century dress. So, and again, this is quite inspired by the idea of kind of a country squire who's wearing riding dress and the simplicity of it, the, the, the naturalness, the freshness of the materials. It really um, it had been sweeping through a lot of Europe for a while in the late 18th century in Anglomania, but this kind of a sort of smart kind of riding costume became the standard for menswear. And it was said across Europe that if you were wearing English clothing, you were acceptably dressed for anywhere, particularly with, with men's dress. So, but of course, you know, the ideal body um, and how we make ideal bodies and idealize our bodies through clothes was, of course, um, a problem for Regency people as well. And while you have these fantastic um, pieces of tailoring that show us exactly uh, the way that the tailors are achieving some of these, this crispness of fit, so these beautiful M notched collars here that you can see, um, and this incredibly delineated outline is created by not folding edges in and, and just having kind of raw edges. But I also love these kind of pictures. This is a, a whole series of um, portraits of the City of London done by Richard Dighton based on real people. And you can see how the kind of the ideal of this cutaway Regency coat works on very different figures that the tails of his coat are hanging far too long because this gentleman is quite short, but he's, he's got the right proportions in and how it's straining across the belly of the larger gentleman and how the kind of the body works with clothing at this point as well. Um, one of the things that we find, I find often in um, when people discuss clothing is people knowing other people by their clothing because they changed it so infrequently, especially for, for men's coats, which cost a lot more than women's. So, you know, the, the way it wore in, you could sort of hang so your, someone's coat on a hook and still know it was their, their shape and their physicality. So this kind of, the influence of riding dress, um, it also comes in with a new mobility. The roads are being improved. Um, carriages are being improved that, there's a lot of kind of moving around and thicker or woolen versions of normal garments are proving kind of very stout traveling companions for both men and women. So you can see that she's actually wearing a kind of a, a, a traveling pelisse here. Um, and you see a lot of carriage dresses in women's, uh, Regency women's clothing, because of course there's horses, there's mud, these are unpaved roads. So they need to have something that is quite sturdy that is going to be able to shuck off any of the weather and the outsideness that comes in upon them. So you also get then uh, a lot of women wearing riding habits. This is one from 1795, still showing the kind of the, the triangular shape that had been so typical throughout the 18th century. Um, but the idea, riding habits were made of wool by tailors and they were worn not just for riding, but for traveling, uh, for kind of almost casual dress. And they were often used for kind of keeping people warm as well. And one of the questions I had a lot while I was researching the book was how did Regency women keep warm? Because again, there's this kind of endless summer muslin filled view of Regency dress. But you can see here from this wonderful picture of a long woolen pelisse with a fur muff and a fur tippet that they just put on lots of clothes over the top. And one of my favorite quotes is from um, Mariah Edgeworth 
uh, Austen's fellow author, who described what she wore in an open carriage visiting a cloth manufactory in northern England in November. And she said she was well wrapped up. First, my grey cloth gown. Secondly, a third pelisse. Third, a red shawl. Fourthly, a large tippet. Besides all these coverings, I had a great box coat over my knees. In short, I was warm as a dormouse. And another thing that women used to keep warm was this distinctive red cloak, which again, they used quite effectively in um, Emma. And this was thought, although it was um, seen in America as well, the cardinal cloak had been around for a while, European visitors thought this kind of uh, country red cloak was quite a distinctively English fashion. And another of my beloved discoveries from this book was how often people were wearing essentially thermal underwear uh, in the form of flannel. And in Sense and Sensibility, when Marianne Dashwood complains that Colonel Brandon seems terribly old and ill because he talks of flannel waistcoats, this is the kind of garment that they mean. Undyed wool garments, um, the waistcoat was something that went under the shirt rather than being on, on top. Um, and they're kind of fluffy, fluffy lined warm garments that you wear under everything else. And this is a woman being horrified at a visit from Dr. Flannel who's suggesting that she wears a petticoat under her gown. So this kind of balancing how to keep warm with looking like a Greek statue, it's these kind of compromises and tactics that just don't get talked about often in fashion histories um, or the kind of, you know, flannel drawers that are worn as well. And at a period when Britain is at war for, um, you know, many, many years at a time, the flannel clothing is actually mentioned again and again in uh, martial sources as being a really important kind of tool for soldiers. And you can see here the female patriotism dressing a man all in his flannel clothing. It was seen as um, the kind of the, the, the way to keep warm and healthy on campaign, whether you were invading Russia or in the tropics, um, off in the Caribbean or out in India. It's amazing how often flannel clothing comes up as being recommended by doctors and fighting men. So Colonel Brandon, who has of course been out in India and has seen active service, he's wearing flannel waistcoats and Austin is kind of playing on that other trope, the military trope of the waistcoats, which is, is kind of lost to us now. And as I say, the, the influence of army clothing on men's dress is quite far reaching. From the 1790s, you have a much greater mobilization of men into both the army and into militias. So a lot of the ease of clothing that, um, or the, the, the techniques of clothing that come from uniform find their way into men's dress. So as I say, the use of wearing boots in the country, uh, in the city, it becomes more acceptable because there's a kind of a martial heroism around it. The idea of long, long trousers that fit within the boot but hug the leg, they become pantaloons rather than the short breeches because these are much easier for riding. The gorget, which is um, a piece of armor that protects the neck, becomes the stock, which is almost like a corset for the neck. It's uh, usually a black silk, uh, stiffened and sometimes whaleboned neck covering for men. And all of the details as well of the, um, the buttons and the frogging, they find their way into men's dress and from there into women's dress as well. So here's um, an example of the Spencer, which again, that's sort of the short cropped jacket, which is one of the new garments that comes through in the Regency period for women, but it's actually a loan into female wardrobes from male wardrobes. So it came uh, from there first and from, from there was adopted into um, women's clothing. So here again is um, example of pantaloons and this is George IV when Prince of Wales in his very resplendent Hussars uniform wearing um, a pair of extremely figure hugging pantaloons that leave not much to the imagination um, because another important thing about these is they're actually made of knitted fabric. So they're slightly stretchy. So they really do cling to the body. And in the same way that we're seeing um, a lot of women's bosoms and sort of indications of nipples through clothing, what's happening with Regency fashion for men is that the, the skirts of the waistcoat and the coats have kind of moved to the waist definitively for the first time. So there is a lot of emphasis on their thighs and groins as well. So in a sense, we can say that I suppose 
fashion gets sexier. It's, it's figure hugging, it's closer fitting, and um, both sexes are noticing it. So you can see here as well the difference between um, how fashion might be, the one garment might be adopted fashionably and might be worn as part of normal dress. So this picture here is a caricature of a dandy um, wearing exaggerated dress. He's got very, very tight boots. He's admiring himself in the shine of his boots, long spurs, extraordinarily tight pantaloons, a very, very short jacket. This is the same garments, but rendered into exaggeration, into kind of fashionable caricature of dress. And at the same time, um, this is a gentleman from the same series of Richard Dighton's pictures. Um, so this is 1824, and he's wearing normal fitting pantaloons with his boots, but with his very respectable morning coat as part of um, everyday dress that is completely acceptable for wearing in the city. Another fantastic military um, adaptation into clothing is Cossack trousers. And these came directly from um, people looking at what the Cossack troops that accompanied the Tsar, Tsar um, Alexander, when he visited Russia, when he visited London from Russia after the first conquest of Napoleon in 1814. And these extremely gathered full at the hips trousers became uh, entered men's dress as Cossack trousers. But even the fact that we have trousers at all is uh, comes from Regency clothing, because previously in the 18th century, men always wore breeches, or breeches as they were pronounced, uh, that finished at the knee. And the idea of long breeches that finished at the ankle, were they, they, these have been worn by working men and especially sailors and um, maritime men for a long time throughout the 18th century. And they kind of rise up in society and the heroism and the admiration that is given to both the army and the navy for their efforts during the Napoleonic Wars start to, excuse me, start to bring trousers into fashion where they stay ever since and breeches become kind of archaic. So by about 1815, trousers are starting to become normal clothing for men and by 1820, they have become normalized and of course are with us ever since. But it's that importance of naval men that I think really um, it has the best connection with Austen's life as well. She had two brothers in the Navy, uh, Frank and Charles, and the Navy was extremely important to her um, personally and emotionally. But what we also have, and I think this is, um, I, I love this portrait of Captain Gilbert Heathcote. This is a portrait painted when he achieved his captaincy in 1806, which is the same year that Captain Wentworth was made a captain. So I included this one in the book because um, I think this is how Captain Wentworth probably would have looked in his newly resplendent uniform. But it's something that we sort of don't think about so much is the fact that all of these naval men um, deployed in the Napoleonic Wars and you know Britain's Navy was its, its envy, they are traveling, they are moving around the world, they are blockading, um, you know, escorting ships back from the East Indies carrying amazing textiles, they are um, intercepting American ships when they're fighting with them, they are uh, interfering with slave ships going across the Atlantic Ocean, um, of course after the abolition of slavery in 1808, but you know it's still um, it continues on in the Americas and Caribbean, they are blockading into Europe. And so you have this whole, this kind of expansive traveling people uh, moving around the world, as well as people going out to the colonies, east, the East and West Indies, which um, as John Stuart Mill said, with the West Indies in the Caribbean, that the trade between it is, you know, not even seen as foreign trade, it's, it's virtually domestic. And the number of people going out with the East India Company uh, to India uh, as merchantmen means that you have this kind of expansion of what the British world is and where the same kind of people who were Austin's neighbours and friends, they take themselves out of these kind of British spheres and are moving in different environments but sort of maintaining Britishness through their clothing. And even, you know, the world and the, the global influence is essential to Regency dress and 
Well, so much of that is foreign gets kind of normalized and just absorbed into Regency dress. So for example, of course, the white muslin dress, the, the little white dress of the period, the ubiquitous, the iconic piece of Regency clothing, all of that muslin, first of all, came from the East Indies, um, from Bengal and um, uh, in, you know, all across India and was exported into Britain. So it was one of the spurs of the Industrial Revolution in Britain to really try and compete with the incredible quality that was coming in from the East. They wanted market share. And this is a photograph of a sleeve that belonged to Princess Charlotte, the only child of um, George IV, who died tragically in childbirth in 1817, and is the reason that Queen Victoria became queen. And you can see the incredible transparent uh, quality of the muslin. This is the, the finest versions of Indian muslin that were coming in. And of course, Britons wanted, you know, cheaper, cheaper copies. So this is where the comment from Henry Tilney in Northanger Abbey about he gave only five shillings a yard for it and that a true Indian muslin. It was about um, a knowledgeable consumption about what was real Indian muslin and what was British muslin that wasn't quite as good. But there is a really other interesting um, point about Indian dress as well, uh, this high-waisted white columnar look that is so typical of Regency dresses is generally uh, accredited to a classical influence and to, to neoclassicism, which is rife and has been growing throughout the 18th century. But there is a um, wonderful example uh, in a couple of places I've seen now from old India hands who say, no, no, this, this dress that we all, everyone wears is actually based on a particular, um, uh, the Peshwas of Indian women. And when you look at it, you go, actually, yes, they're wearing white dresses with high bust lines that is made out of muslin. So I'm wondering whether or not there is actually an Indian influence in the shapes there as well. But even this idea of transparency, and a garment, a fabric that you can see through becomes really influential in the spurring on of things like lace making. And that you get um, a huge increase in the number of machine made tules and nets and gauzes and laces and all of these things that reproduce muslin's transparency. Again, it kind of spurs innovation and creativity. And so you start getting this idea of um, slips. So colored gowns, worn underneath a, a white muslin or a net gown that changes the color underneath. And again, this is one of the details they get really right in the new Emma. So it's, it's like seeing and capturing a new taste for transparency. We also have, of course, you know, we've got the bonnet, the muslin gown and the shawl is a really influential piece of Regency dress. Uh, but they are again from India, uh, from Indian areas and from Kashmir in particular. English women appear to have adopted them first in the 1760s and from there they spread in fashionability um, until they became, you know, sort of a normal part of dress and then may even made into dresses themselves. And when Lady Bertram in Mansfield Park, is, she's, she gets sort of nearly excited about William Price's promotion to lieutenant. And she says, William must not forget my shawl if he goes to the East Indies. And I shall give him a commission for anything else that is worth, worth having. I wish he may go to the East Indies that I may have my shawl. And what's really going on here is that Lady Bertram is trying to take advantage of the fact that as um, a naval officer, William gets tax-free importation allowances. So, Genuine Indian shawls were incredibly expensive from 50 to 100 pounds, um, even after imports. And so what she's saying is, look, you know, can my nephew get me one duty free, essentially? And this whole, the notion of, of duty free and black market and smuggling was you know, another thing that uh, I was surprised to find the extent of. There's one of the, again, the truisms about Regency dress is that somehow France and England were cut off from each other and um, didn't get information about fashion, uh, new fashions and new styles. And when you look into it, what you actually see is that smuggling and con contraband is passing merrily between the two countries uh, at a much greater rate than it used to. So 
everybody smuggled. It was kind of the middle class crime, like downloading things. And this is, you know, this is an example of the Austin family smuggling. So Fanny Austin was born in Bermuda and she married uh, Charles Austin, Jane's younger brother in Halifax in Nova Scotia. And when she married him, they came back and were stationed uh, in the channel on, on a boat than the Muir. And so when her sister sends out a box from Bermuda, um, what Fanny does is sends a boat to intercept it, take it off the ship, take it back to their ship, because if it went through London, passed through customs, it would either be seized or taxed. So then she just repacked everything and then sent it from inside London, England. And there's lots and lots of examples of this kind of um, very cheerful smuggling. So I quite like thinking about how much is going on illicitly in terms of fashion contributions. But it is kind of those influences and the way British manufacturers are seeking to capture market share and get, get make cheaper versions for of, of garments that people are really um, excited about. This is where you get things like the explosion of shawls from the 1810s. Um, I like both of these women. This is Hannah Moore, the didactic novelist painted by Henry William Pickersgill in 1822, and this lovely little miniature um, with her spectacles. She always reminds me of Miss Bates in Emma. But both of these women are wearing shawls. And at this point, they're probably the cheaper British shawls that are being made in the established woolen manufacturing areas like um, Norwich and Edinburgh, and eventually Paisley in Scotland, which is how that bote teardrop shape becomes called Paisley in um, in English. But just to kind of give you an idea of the scope of the possibilities of transporting textiles around the world, but also how Jane Austen, even though she's sitting in southern Britain, she is inherently and personally connected with the world and how those connections contributed to her wardrobe. So Fanny Austen in September 1810, she writes to her sister and says, we shall send you a part of our brother Frank's China present and I hope it will prove acceptable. So that's in September and in August, just before Francis Austen, who'd been stationed out in um, Canton, he was traveling from Canton up to Madras and then back to England uh, as part of an armed escort for East India Company ships. And he she, so he gives he then sends once he gets back to Britain he sends over the Atlantic a piece of India crepe as Fanny Austen calls it which she has made up into a gown for herself and for her sister so already one man has directed this textile um, we, she says India crepe so we can say from here around nearly halfway around the world but. China is the traditional home of silk production. And by 1813, we have references in Austen's letters to a China crepe gown that both she and Cassandra had, because they often had matching gowns. So th this is mentioned a few times. And I would suggest actually that both Cassandra and Jane's China crepe is the same pieces of fabric that Frank obtained that he sent across um, the Atlantic. So he's dressed four women with one textile gift that he personally took from somewhere as far away as China. And I just think that's the most wonderful kind of connections and, and you know, how far we can really get by looking at, at dress and Austin. So I will just finish there by looking at one of my favorite paintings of the Regency period, which is the A Ball at the Clifton Assembly painted in 1818 by the artist Rolinda Sharples. And It's not in the best condition now, but it has so many wonderful details of Regency dress. It also shows how by the sort of the 1818 period, the idea of kind of the black dull men in their woolen clothing and their, um, their white shining female dress has been established, but also little things like the hat held under the arm, a fan, a decorated cap, a turban, a uh, fantastic pair of Hessian boots with a red heel and a silver gilt trim. This is, it, it all helps us to kind of read the image of how people dressed like Regency people would, to read their clothing in the same way that we read Austen as not just as fashion, but as complex identity. And I hope, um, you know, if you read the book, it gives you ways to reread 
Regency fashion in the same way that we read and reread Austen for the pleasure of just how well she observed these people. So I will end there and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Hilary. That was great. Um, I would now direct everyone to, uh, if you have any questions, please enter them into either the chat or Q&A area. I can see that we already have some questions. So I'm going to just begin with the first one from Jeff Schnabel in Kansas City, who asked, was the dress, both for men and women, in Australia a duplication of the styles of England in the 18th century, or did Australia have its own unique styles? What an excellent question and one I appreciate from my homeland. Um, I do actually talk about this in the book. Um, it was pretty much a replication of British style and a lot of, especially for the women, the way that they would maintain social cachet as the colony developed and um, especially as convict women became emancipated and could buy their own things is, is by shopping back in Britain. They did long distance proxy shopping. So they'd go, you look, send me this bonnet and a new gown and I'd like this many ribbons. But when people came out to Australia from Britain by about sort of the 1810s, certainly by the 1820s, they thought that the fashion, especially for women, was gaudier and more vulgar. And there was quite a sort of, they were slightly shocked when they got off the boat at how like Australian fashion was a little bit extra. But in general, the settler classes tried to maintain the same social standards of dress and taste as in Britain. And they did that through kind of personal networks. Great. Um, so uh, we actually have kind of two questions. We were asking the same question, so I'm just going to combine them. So my question is simply underwear. What did men and women wear under those wonderful clothes and how did that affect their behavior? And just I'll just include the other one. Aside from your discussion of stays, will you address Regency undergarments or were there any? No. Regency women did not wear underpants. Um, this is the this is what one of the other wonderful things about the, the the picture of comfort is so for a Regency woman to get dressed first of all she puts on her chemise which is kind of a knee length linen garment that goes next to the skin and then over that she's putting on whatever bust support support she's using uh, stays or corsets um, and then petticoats over that but you know something that kind of goes over the legs between the legs uh, you get some drawers slightly um, into the sort of 1800s periods, but more as a kind of, um, a, to kind of cover up legs being seen through the, the gowns, but they were still split at the crotch. Men, um, and again, is shown is beautifully in the new Emma, they could either wear their shirt tucked between their legs as a form of underpants, but they were also linen drawers and flannel drawers that were washable that they wore um, underneath their trousers. So yeah, for, for women, it, it, it's all sort of linen clothing, but the idea of kind of concept of underpants or knickers or drawers or whatever you want to call them, it did not exist. Um, so yes, bare, bare bottoms for all. Uh, but for, for women underneath, but men uh, were wearing kind of linen linings to their to their trousers. Great. Um, so another question: uh, Are you aware of the tailor in Brighton who has adopted Regency dress as a permanent lifestyle? Yes, Zach Pinsent. Um, yes, his work is absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah. We follow each other on social media, but I've never met him. So from Jane Ford de Torre, uh, what is going on in the lower right corner of the last painting by Sharples? Is the hostess of the gathering cleaning a guest's shoes or helping her change from travel shoes into party clothes? Thank That's you so much. Easy exactly what is happening. What a beautiful detail to pick up on. I'm so glad you saw that. Um, what would happen is when you would come to a ball, whether that was a private ball or in someone's house like at Netherfield or a public ball in the assembly rooms like here, uh, dancing slippers or evening shoes were delicate and satin and fine. So you would travel uh, in your list shoes and then once you got to the ball, you would change your shoes over. So it's like, you know, the difference between wearing your trainers to work and then putting on your high heeled shoes. So what's happening there is that a, um, a servant is helping the woman change her shoes from her outdoor shoes to her dancing shoes. And then you do the reverse in once you went home. All right, well, oh, no, hold on. Oh, more question just came in. 
What colors prints did poorer women gravitate towards since I assumed a white dress would have been unattainable for any women who did real work? That's a really good point. And in Mansfield Park, there's, a, there's an interesting kind of dichotomy discussion about the white dress because Edmund Bertram says at one point, a woman can never be too fine in white. But what of course he means is women have his own class and status. Whereas when they go on the visit to, um, oh, uh, Mariah's fiance's place, I can't remember the name. Anyway, um, Mrs. Norris is very pleased because the housekeeper doesn't let the housemaids wear white. And one of the, the, the kind of the narratives around muslin gowns is that, you know, it's cotton, it's washable, it's egalitarian, but it's a very fragile fabric. You have to have a lot of um, time and leisure or staff to kind of maintain it, to keep it white, to, you know, mend a great slit in my muslin gown, as Lydia Bennett asks her maid to do. So for working women, um, they still liked to engage with kind of colour and pattern as much as they could. There's a greater popularity in checked prints, uh, checked like woven fabrics. Uh, one of the rises in the, the predominance of cottons and cotton prints means that more decorative pretty patterns are available to um, a wider range of society. And also for just gentry women, when they're working at home, there's a lot of kind of darker prints, uh, you know, black backgrounds, red backgrounds. I put a lot of these in the books as well that are just, they don't show the dirt as well. So for working women, and I, I've got enough material to write a whole book on Regency working dress. I'd love to do it, but I'm, I'm not sure my publishers would be so excited. Uh, there is, it's kind of just plainer fabrics, or more sort of checked or things that are woven in. They're also getting their, um, they're getting their clothing a lot from secondhand markets. So they can buy things that are second, third, fourth hand uh, that may be a little bit nicer have come from, um, you know, a middle class or upper class woman's wardrobe. And they seem to have been quite active consumers of fashion as much as they were able to. But yeah, a little bit, little bit plainer um, and a little bit sturdier. So kind of tougher linens, tougher cottons, more wools than these kind of delicate muslins. All right, so uh, the next question asked, how were these garments kept clean and deodorized? Well, cotton is washable. So um, any sort of cotton outer garments could be washed. They were, they were done very carefully. Uh, one of the advantages of having linen, especially for the things that hit the body, is that it can be boiled and it can take much tougher treatment than cotton can. So lots of linen petticoats, linen chemises. The idea is that you never had the outer gown really touch your skin too much. Um, there are fantastic household account books and recipe books that give you ways to clean every possible thing you can imagine. How to clear starch lace and how to clear starch muslin and how to get... Um, how to get uh, you know grease stains out of silk. So basically there was a lot of what we've now called dry cleaning for things that couldn't actually be washed. And those things that were washed were done sort of carefully. Um, you know, the outer garments wouldn't have been washed as so much as, as we do them now, but the inner garments, people could, you know, if you could afford it, you could change your linen three times a day. And that, you know, kept you very clean and, and it just meant that someone else had to do your washing, uh, which was quite an arduous business. Uh, so yeah, a lot of lot of lot of washing, lot of um, very skilled spot cleaning. So Sherry Rose Bond asks: Was the white muslin dress worn by women of a certain age, or did they wear colors? And did younger women wear color? They did absolutely. Um, you know, the, the muslin dress is kind of it's often accessorized by a lot of colors. You see this in fashion plates where you have like a white dress and then the purple hat, purple spencers, purple gloves, and purple shoes, or it's yellow, or it's um, you know red, or, or whatever it is. So the white muslin dress was kind of appropriate for all ages. Um, the, a lot of the difference in the showing age was how much you, how much chest you showed. So the younger you were, the more décolletage you could show, and the more hair you, you, the more hair you had on display as well. So younger women did definitely wear colour, but it was sort of thought that as you got older, you should adopt sort of more sober, more gracious, more dignified colours. You know, less less frilly, less less bright, brightly coloured, but this is one of the great things about looking at the account books of someone like Mrs. Topham, because it finishes, she, she dies when she's in her early 70s. And you look at what she's buying, and she's buying muslin gowns. She's spending lots of money on fab, you know, fashion that she clearly loves. There's ambers and greens and blues. And you know she, she's clearly 
enjoys colour and clothing. So again, what was supposed to be done and what people are really doing, there's always a bit of a bit of a slip between it, which I love. Great. So our next question is from Barbara Bouchel, who I, I think this is in regard is regarding kind of the discussion on underwear is what happened when women had their periods once a month? I love this question. Um, I have been asked this a lot and I love that people ask it so much so that I actually talk about it in the book. Um, my answer is I haven't got any definite information on what women actually did. So I've had to conjecture. And I tell you, I read books on childbirth, on conception, on, um, you know, on women's health from doctors written at the time, scouring them, trying to find any information about what women actually did. Um, they, you know, they talk about everything to do with it, but not actually how women managed. Um, as best I can tell, I found a, a washing bill from Eliza Jarvis that is sending her personal linen, so her like her, her, her nightcaps, her nightgowns, her chemises and two napkins for washing. And if this was table linen, then she'd be sending it with the household linen, but it's intimate and it's personal. And as far as I can tell, they're either pinning um, folded fabric between their legs to their chemise or actually wearing it now like what we would consider a, a diaper, which is actually the, the, the name comes from diapered fabric, which is, you know, quite, uh, it's woven, it's quite absorbent. And it look, I found some evidence after the book that actually women sort of almost wore a diaper um, at that time of the month. And that was, was what they did. Um, but there's also wearing quite a lot of petticoats in between that and the outer gown, because of course, you know, white gowns, show everything. But as far as I can tell, that's how they managed it. All right, not so much a question, but a comment from Robin Sinclair who, at, who states, so really Regency dress is unnatural naturalism. Such an interesting revelation and so human. Thank you for, fast, for your fascinating research. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, 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 really, I'm really glad you liked it. I think um, for me, that sort of that humanness was something I really wanted to discover because you know, we see these beautiful ideals on screen and it all looks lovely, but, you know, what do you do when you're cold? What do you do at that time of the month? What do you do, you know, when you want to look like this, but maybe your body type doesn't fit? And it's that kind of how humans react to clothing and, and how they use it to build culture that I just find so interesting about dress. So I'm, I'm so glad you do as well. All right, well, that actually concludes all of the questions that we've received. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Hillary, for that. That was, that was great. I'm now gonna invite Karen Karpovich, our executive director, uh, back up. I think she's here. Anyway, thank you again, Hillary. It was wonderful. You were worth, well worth waiting for. And please keep us abreast on your books and we'll make everyone aware of your books and when we can buy them. We, we were waiting to hear about, you know, read them. I'm sure we all are after this. Thank you again. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending this evening. This was one of our best attended events. Um, and I'm sure that everybody's been satisfied with what they heard this evening. I know I'm kind of fascinated by everything I learned. I also wanted to mention that this Thursday at five o'clock, we'll be celebrating Thanksgiving with our Arnick, uh, our Arnick um, group in New York City with our teachers and tutors. And uh, that's at five o'clock Eastern time. If you're available, please come celebrate Thanksgiving with us. I know this is gonna be a very challenged Thanksgiving for so many of us. So we'll try to celebrate the best we can. And then on December the 14th, uh, please join us for the Queen Six and a tour of Windsor Castle at Christmas time. So again, thank you, Hillary. We are very appreciative of your time. And we look forward to seeing you again. We welcome you back. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, really everybody. Good night. Bye.